This is Will Stewart from OnlineChessLessons.net, and I'm looking at a game from round one of the first Super Tournament of 2012. This is the Tata Steel Chess Tournament being held in Viganzi, and uh, this is a game between none other than the highest rated player in the world, Magnus Carlsen, and uh, with the black pieces there is Vugar Gashimov, no, uh, no scrub himself. He's rated about 2760, very strong player from Azerbaijan. So Carlson here opening up in the first round. I believe this is a 14-player round robin format at the Tata Steel Tournament. So you know you really don't uh, a loss early can really hurt you. So Carlson just opening up with you know just a basic English uh, English opening style. He's really played this a lot in his career since early on. And with G3, you know just just a basic English opening. Gashimov he goes for the Hedgehog essentially with this B6 move. So the Hedgehog, very cool, you know, became real popular in the 70s, and uh, really, really a cool opening, you know, very flexible ideas. So standard opening play here, and with D4, Carlson makes a commitment towards the center. You know, moves like D3, probably not quite as good, because what White wants to do here, you know, the, the plan for White, is that White is going to be getting a space advantage in the center, if, if he wants, and, and he probably should take it. Because that's just a, it's, it's like a free space advantage. And Black's idea is going to be kind of like a compressed spring strategy with the Hedgehog, trying to make some thematic breaks in the center, um, probably later trying to play something like D5 or B5, normally to challenge White's control of the center. So in this position, very important, White doesn't play Knight takes F3, because it doesn't make any sense. Why do you want to let Black trade off this awesome light squared bishop on G2? It's just simply logical. So instead... Carlson, you know, he just develops his queen, maintains the tension in the center. So the queen's very active here. And now d6. So it seems like knight c6 for black, maybe just not getting it done. I, I think white sometimes plays queen d2 with b3 and bishop b2 in this. And uh, the knight maybe is just kind of misplaced because it's closing in this bishop and maybe giving white some ideas for tactics. Um, trying to play something like knight to e5 and, and open up white's bishop on the diagonal. So, and this explains black's plan here of delaying the development of this b8 knight because he wants to see where it's best to develop, whether it's c6, even a6, or d7. So with d6, and so now after a6, this is like the classic hedgehog, this a6 idea is... Um, the, the idea is, is very straightforward, trying to prevent white from playing some kind of knight b5 and achieving more pressure on this weak d6 pawn. So Carlson here, very interesting decision. He captures the knight, gives up that dark squared bishop because he felt maybe it was, uh, it, it was just time. You know, maybe he plays a move like, I don't know, rook fd1, and maybe now black, after knight d7, it's very difficult for white to generate counterplay on the d-file against this d6 pawn because the bishop can just stay on it. You know, now if bishop takes, knight takes. Not the same thing. So Carlson, a, a very interesting idea, not hesitant at all to just go for the exchange. And after queen f4, black really doesn't want to play a move like e5 because what this is going to do, even the queen, you know, on just e3 is very comfortable, very centralized. And now this d5 square, you can't take pawn moves back. So there are no black pawns that can cover that d5 square. Um, and, and not to mention the d6 pawn is very weak, very difficult to defend this. So positionally, this is not fun for black. So instead, Geshimov, you know, castles, now rook d1, standard stuff. Carlson, by moving the f rook instead of the a rook, is, you know, it just makes sense. Because all the, all the action is going on on the queen side here. White is most likely not going to be playing any ridiculous moves like g4. Although it is an interesting idea. <laughs> I, I think, uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm always tempted to play this kind of stuff, but these kind of pawn moves are usually for suckers, really. I mean, uh, you know, something like h4, and well, this doesn't seem like it's going to work very well as the white pawns are going to be fixed on the king side. So not going to work. So anyway, not, not to get too carried away, just g4, you really don't see that idea here. But it does look interesting. So rook d1. Now bishop back to e7. So what's going on? That's that's not cool. I mean, with bishop back to e7, that means white has gained some time in the opening. 
with uh, giving up that dark squared bishop. So really a pretty cool idea by Carlson. Now he plays knight e4, which looks like it's going to force white is going to be getting this bishop is pretty much what that seems. I mean, d5 just doesn't make any sense. Maybe just knight back to c3 or or something. I mean, it just, it, it this doesn't feel right for, for black to be playing this d5 move it just, there's going to be too many tactics against the black queen. So instead, Gashimov takes, now he plays rook a7. So pretty cool move as well. It was, you know, knight d7 here, maybe not as good because now it seems like the c6 square is going to be very soft. And once that knight gets in there, he's probably not going to go anywhere anytime soon. So rook a7, and this is a pretty, not a common idea, but it's, it's an idea. It's an, 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 an acknowledged idea in the hedgehog to lift this rook like this. And sometimes it goes to d7 to push d5. Or as Gashimov plays in the game, brings the rook to c5 where it's very active. And so the knight is playing d back here. White, at this point in the game, I, I should point out as well, these tactics taking the pawn on c4. It seems like knight takes e6. And white's just going to be winning. It's going to win some material. Uh, this this is just not gonna work out. <laughs> uh, the the rook is gonna go somewhere, and and I don't even want to know. I mean, this this looks pretty bad for black. So anyway, so the pawn on c4 not exactly touchable. So rook c5, okay. And again, bl black doesn't want to play e5 because it, it would be surrendering valuable, very just critical squares on d5 and f5 as well as giving him a permanent weakness, this backwards pawn on, on d6. So instead, Gashimov, you know, Quincy 7 and so Carlson's got to play b3. Black was actually going to take the pawn. So black here, how, how black wants to get counterplay, kingside attack, this, uh, this seems kind of silly. It doesn't really seem appropriate. It would just only serve to weaken black's kingside. So what black wants to do, he'd, he'd really like to develop this knight, although it allows this hole to be taken advantage of on c6. So that's not looking so hot. So what black needs to do to gain counterplay, first of all, he can just sit and try to wait for white to overextend. Or black is going to play the thematic breaks I mentioned earlier with d5 or b5, trying to open up pressure on the c file and the queen side. Maybe a little mi minority attack, for example, with, with b5. So first he plays king h8. I, I guess he just didn't want to mess around with any tactics on e6 or you name it. So now Carlson with queen b1. This was a pretty interesting idea. So knight d7, e3. And, and just watch how Carlson just, okay, so rook to c2 is weird. This was a weird move. And I'm having, you know, when I was watching the game, I was really having trouble understanding why. Why rook here? I, I think maybe the idea was to play rook to c1 and to play b4. That's, you know, my food for thought. I think that was the idea. So pretty interesting. In this kind of position, white is often just going to be probing, probing different ideas and trying to execute something decisive at the best time to take advantage of his opponent's position. So that's exactly what Carlson's doing. So black has solved the problem of developing the knight. And black has got, you know, his heavy pieces look nice. He, his position looks good. It's just this, this bishop. It's just, it's cutting the board in half, and it's making black's life really difficult. So now with queen to a2, it seems like Carlson changed his mind, or, or whatever you want to call it. And instead of playing rook to c1, he played queen to a2, and I think maybe now he wants to play a5 and establish pressure on, um, on the a file there. I'm just guessing. Maybe also he was planning on answering with b4, where the queen is now supporting the c4 pawn, and, you know, who knows, but possibly something like this, establishing a strong point at c6. So Carlson, you know, he's just, just pushing. See, that's subtle pressure, just maneuvering out h3. You know, no funny business with this knight, making, creating loop for the white king. And so now rook back to d2. So Carlson, very nice, very instructive, not creating any weaknesses in his own position, not overextending. So that's, that's exactly what black is waiting for. And instead, white is just slowly probing for weakness and trying to catch black, you know, with a, that decisive breakthrough when he least expects it. So first with f4. So Carlson realized now 
you know, there's no way, you know, A5 is, you know, the rook is too active here. And B4 is prevented, you know, C, C4 will drop. So there's no way to push for anything. You know, white has nothing to lose here. He, he's not going to lose this game by playing F4. And he's only going to create activity and push black's knight back. All good things. So now rook to D3. And so now queen to D2. So Carlson, what a cool plan with the queen coming to B, B1 to A2. You know, kind of feigning at playing A5 maybe. And now achieving... A, a really nice tripling restructuring of the white pieces. So he entices black to play e5 here, which is a very committal move. He can't take those pawn moves back. And now with b5, you know, Gashimov, it seems like he achieves, he, okay, he didn't play d5, but he did play e5 here. So, but the bishop is, you know, kind of hitting its own pawn. The knight is fairly well contained by, by the white pawns. And meanwhile, Carlson just coolly he takes b5 and now he plays knight to a3. So b4 is not possible. And so now black has got to take on c4 and play knight takes c4. So the dust is cleared and black did manage to achieve activity, although it did cost him by giving white a pass pawn. Pass b pawn is pretty nice, especially when you got this bishop, you know, just ready to support it and also protect the white king. So Gashimov, he goes with d5. And, you know, this was not like some clown combination. I mean, d5, this is no joke. This is, um, this is a nice combo. So I think if knight b6, you know, knight b6 is just going to open a big can of worms. And maybe, maybe he was even thinking about sacking here. Sacking the pawn and some something to play e4 possibly. I mean... It just is going to get complicated. Possibly queen b7, um, or, or even queen b8 maybe is even better, and trying to you know pick up this b3 pawn. So so definitely very complicated. So Carlson, he just goes with bishop takes d5. He's not messing around. And this was the idea. Queen takes h3. So now essentially forcing a trade of queens, queen g2. And it seemed, you know, when I first saw this, I'm thinking... Black should be able to draw this game. I mean, Gashima's 2760. You know, he's got to be top 10 in the world. And he takes this pawn. And I thought here, Carlson might take with this pawn, with the G pawn, trying to maybe create a pass pawn here. The downside, you know, trying to create more imbalances, essentially in the position due to the existence of the opposite colored bishops. The downside for G takes would be that this would give Black counterplay. This would give him, you know, a, just a free pass pawn. So also E takes, this is a somewhat more fluid pawn structure for white, definitely more solid, and it, it will also help protect his king. So Gashimov, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm sitting here watching the game and thinking, how is Carlson going to win this? And, and why he is the, I think, is the best player in the world right now is because he always wins these games. Nine times out of ten, when you think uh, he might draw, you know, so now F6, so trying to get off this target here, avoid any tactics. And this will serve to weaken more squares around Black's king. So bishop to e4. And so now Carlson pushes with b4. There's a trade of rooks on the table, which I thought would benefit Black more than white. Just objectively in the end game, with the opposite colored bishops, white needs to keep on... Uh, he needs to keep some more material on the board so that he'll be able to control some dark squares to push this pawn through without getting blockaded. So now Gashimov, he trades... White does not want to trade the other pair of rooks because that's a one less piece that he can have uh, to, to help push his pawn on the dark squares. So instead, knight takes. And so now rook c1 and Carlson is slowly pushing forward with the knight and, and slowly trying to gain squares. So now, you know, he, he can trade the rooks, but it needs to be under a very good circumstance for white. So he needs to make sure he gets the most out of it. So first... You know, nice, nice, very nice play here. It's like Carlson suckered the rook in with activity and then cuts it off from the defense of this pawn and the defense uh, of the black king and the black king side. So knight d3, very nice concept. Now a series of very forcing moves by Carlson. Throws in this check and now f5. Fantastic. You know, perfectly exploiting that these black pawns are broken up. If pawn takes... This is going to give White some serious mating ideas and very nice attacking concepts against, against Black's cutoff king. 
Now G4, not allowing counterplay again. So black, you know, he throws in, you know, this, this bishop is, is definitely active here. And rook c2. So now knight c6. And white is just slowly creeping. It's just creeping on the black king. So king e2, keeping the king centralized. There was no need to, to go to g2 and chase that bishop. And so h5. So taking the pawn, Gashimov sacks it. Just He's got to get some activity. Otherwise, he's going to get mated. The, the rook is too cut off. Excellent concept with the knight on c5 blocking blocking the, the black rook from, from getting back to help the defense. So Gashimov sacks it. Rook c8, now, you know, he, he can't give white another pass pawn. I mean, this is going to be too easy to win. So he's got to go back and taking a nice moment to play b5. So now, pretty straightforward by Carlson. He just jams the bishop in, trying to set up some tactics. And now he just walks around to pick up the pawn. So first he trades knights. So the knight is not going to give him any problems. Now he's just up two pawns. And, uh, you know, this would seem kind of silly for black. So instead, Gashimov tries, but I mean, the, it, this is classic opposite colored bishops in game technique. You got the two pass pawns, they're far away from each other. Absolutely no way black is going to be able to, to stop both of them because the bishop is always going to be tied up with one, and the white king is going to come over and help the other one, something like that. I mean, I mean, the. White is always going to break through in this position. So after b6, Gashimov just resigned because there's absolutely no way he can stop. The white king is just going to break in, and it's just going to help. With, there's no way black can stop both of these pawns and stop the white king from, from taking f6, for example. It's, it's simply impossible. So Gashimov resigned. So who didn't see it coming? Carlson comes out with a... With a big first round win, really setting the pace high here at the Tata Steel Chess Tournament, first super tournament of 2012. And uh, we'll see if he can uh, maintain that pace for, for the next 12 or 13 rounds here. So this is Will Stewart from OnlineChessLessons.net, and thanks for tuning in.